Thank you guys for sitting through what is a very long day. I'll try and add a little bit of levity throughout. This is a somewhat unusual lecture in the series. Uh, the reason is that I'm speaking about market design, which is my field of economics, and it's not one that's in the standard inequality scholars toolbox. It's so far from the standard inequality scholars toolbox that when I told a lot of my colleagues I was going to be giving a lecture entitled Market Design Approaches to Inequality, they asked me what the heck I was talking about. And that was a little worrisome because I already signed up to give the lecture. But I, you know, I, I pushed ahead and I told them, so here's what I'm going to do. And, most, and often enough, I was quoting back some of their own work. They said, oh, oh, I get it. You're talking about how market design can help address issues of inequality. Yeah, that's the point. <laughs> OK, so with that, I at least managed to convince my colleagues that this is of relevance. And hopefully, I can convince you as well. Today, there will be a talk in three parts. So the first thing I'm going to do is show you how market design works, how we think about the world, what sorts of problems we work on. Then I'm going to talk about one of market design's biggest successes of the last decade, which is the design of school choice mechanisms. And then finally, just to prove, you know, a lot of the talk will be, or a lot of the series will be about school choice, just to prove that we sort of do other things as well and that there are linkages with inequality there and other things you can think about, I'll talk about two other applications, cadet branch matching and the design of eminent domain mechanisms. And then hopefully at the end we'll have some time to talk and learn a little bit more. Tomorrow will be a little bit of a different structure. So today's talk is mostly a survey. Tomorrow we'll take one topic that's gone on in the school choice literature, which is the design of affirmative action mechanisms. And we'll basically go from the first paper in the market design school choice literature on this topic all the way through to research that is you know, in brand new working papers circulated as of a month ago. And we'll see a little bit more of what the current state of research looks like. OK? All right, so first, I would be completely remiss in my duties if I didn't explain what the heck market design is. So, the market design approach. What are we doing? We are applying economics and game theory to redesign institutions, either institutions where there have been market failures and you need new ones, or where there has never been an institution at all. So sometimes, some of the ones we'll see today, we're going to rebuild existing school choice systems and replace the centralized mechanism with some other mechanism that has better incentive properties. Other times, we're going to do something like has been done in the medical match, where there essentially was no market mechanism. And eco economists, along with uh, market policy practitioners, came in and built one. So you're going to get three different cuts of this what is market design. Another one is that we take theory practice to practice and then to evaluation. And there's actually a loop. So I, it's harder to draw in tech. And I decided for the simplicity of the diagram, I wouldn't draw you know, the additional errors from evaluation to theory and evaluation to practice and sometimes practice to theory. I'll reverse them in the talk when appropriate. But really, unlike much of economics, all three of these components are very, very tightly linked here. So an example. And as an example, I'm going to pick one of the earliest applications of matching theory to market design. Theory, 1962, Gale and Shapley wrote a paper in the American Mathematical Monthly. This, some of you may not be familiar with, it's the, chief fla it's the flagship journal of the Mathematical Association of America, and it's a math journal. This paper presented what's called the stable marriage algorithm, or the deferred acceptance algorithm. It's a way of finding marriage in society in which there's no divorce. We won't talk about exactly why the assumptions of the model don't apply to the marriage market. But it turns out that the assumptions work really, really well for the matching of doctors to their residencies. They assume a single centralized match. They assume that the market clears all at once. They assume that people know their full preferences. This actually sounds a lot like the residency match. So eventually. Al Roth and Elliot Perenson and some of their colleagues replaced the previous system that was used to match doctors to their residencies with an algorithm that was based on this Gale Shapley algorithm. So to understand what was going on here, previously, offers were made at one point in time. And then the next year, some hospital would say, you know, I have an idea. Why don't we make our offers a little bit earlier? 
And so they'd make their offers a week earlier. If you get an offer from your second choice hospital, and it's exploding, it's going to explode in a week, and you, you don't know whether your first choice hospital is going to call you. Maybe you wait a couple of days, but you often take that offer. Well, OK. When a week and a half goes by and you get a call from your first choice hospital, one of two things will happen. Either you're going to break your contract, and there's a lot of sort of instability in the market as contracts are being broken, or you're going to say, oh, I'm so sorry. I took an offer a week and a half ago. I can't do anything, although I'd love to work for you. OK. Well, your first choice hospital says, darn that hospital number two. Next year, we're making our offers a week and a half earlier than they did. And gradually, the offers move earlier and earlier and earlier until suddenly doctors are taking jobs and before they've even declared their specialties. And so you might take a job as a surgeon without having ever performed surgery. And it turns out that you might be really bad at surgery if you've never seen the sight of blood. The entire American medical establishment knows they want to change the system, but they can't figure out what's, what to do. You know, it's an equilibrium problem. In equilibrium, you'd like all the offers to be later, but privately, it's always optimal to make yours earlier than everybody else's. And so imposing a new mechanism can be a good solution to this problem. But your new mechanism has to, among other things, change the incentives for the early offers. So in the, the Roth survey you guys read, he talks about the gastroenterology market. To stop the gastroenterology fellowships from making early offers, they actually had to make a profession-wide change in the rules on contracting. So they changed the rules and made it so that you could always accept an early offer, but that you could not contract away your right to take your match partner. So if you took an early offer, you could always enter the centralized match and then take whatever outcome you got there and break your initial contract with no penalty. So this example highlights two facts. One of them is what we can do. We can impose a stable mechanism at the end. And in the end, uh, very soon, we'll see that we do a similar thing in a lot of these school choice problems. But the other, and this is very important as well, is that you have to work within the space of the market. So if there is this incentive for early offers, if the people making the early offers have market power, so if they have the right to contract with you that you will accept an early offer and you won't enter the match, then it's hard to scale the match. It's hard to get participation there. Because the hospitals, who have a lot of market power, these, these fellowships are valuable to the residents, can try to give away, or can try to get residents to sign away their rights. Okay? So theory tells us here's an algorithm you can use, but there are all these concerns that are specific to the market when you're taking the algorithm to practice. Then evaluation. So first of all, the market was stabilized. They did quickly realize they had to add a feature that would allow doctors who were married to other doctors to try and match to similar locations, the couples match. But now you know, we, we can even use some of the data generated from these matches to understand you know, big trends in participation and in the composition of doctors and in the desirability of different positions. There's some work on this that's been done around the couples problem. There are now some students working on trying to get back out. You do structural estimation to try and back out preferences. And from there, you know, it's always possible that it will come back to theory. We'll see more versions of this loop in practice. OK, third cut. What's market design? Economic engineering. It's different from most branches of economics in that it's not predominantly descriptive. Instead, we take a theorem and we impose it on reality. Okay? You know, we have some model that says if people submit preferences of the following type and we pipe them into an algorithm, the outcome has some nice property. And maybe the algorithm incentivizes truthful revelation. And this, like, you can actually do. If you have a mechanism that's strategy proof, there's no incentive for people to game the system, you can impose it, and the amount of gaming goes down and sort of reduces to noise from people who are confused. Another thing that we do is we try and work around impossibility results. So almost every problem we talk about today will be backed by some underlying impossibility theorem that says the best thing you could imagine doing is not possible. Lots of mechanism design stops there. You know, there are tons of negative results throughout mechanism design, but that's sort of not very good if what you want to do is actually change a real world market. And so what we try and do is refine the criteria, get a better understanding of what we really actually want, which parts of the outcomes are more important, and then build around those. 
As I said, we work within existing conditions. So kidney exchange, for example, we have partially because people refuse to sell kidneys. So even if you believe that having a market for kidneys is more efficient, you can still do intermediate things that improve the efficiency of the allocation without going to a full market solution. And then finally, another bonus that sort of comes out of this, and it's, it's often not the motivation, but it's a bonus, is that by doing things that organize the market function, you can actually get real data and like, learn actual things about what people in the market want. So for example, when you have a strategy-proof mechanism, so it's truthfulness is a dominant strategy. I'll say this word strategy proof all the time. We'll define it formally in a minute. When you have a mechanism that incentivizes truthful revelation, you can learn people's true preferences, and then you can adjust things in the market according to their preferences. So if you want to know if there's a school in the area that everybody hates, you can learn that. It's the bottom of everybody's preference list. By contrast, if people are gaming the system and some of the preferences that are submitted to your mechanism come out of strategic behavior, you have no idea how to interpret them. You don't know whether they're truthful and just weird or whether they're de derived from actual strategic behavior. OK, strategy proofness. I said we're going to see this a lot. So in the inequality setting, this is sort of the big one. Strategy proof mechanisms are ones that incentivize truthful play and in the same sense, and we'll see very formally, level the playing field. They make it sort of equal access to everyone or they make the system equal access to everyone. You know, there's, there's no gains from being someone who can do really hard computations in your head. Market thickness, I also talked about this one. If you're going to build a market mechanism, it has to be one which incentivizes participation. People have to want to use it. That's going to mean it can't give them unacceptable outcomes, and it also often will mean that you can't have sort of flagrantly unfair outcomes, or un outcomes that are unfair in ways that might cause people to you know, want to quit. We also, as I said, we set down evaluation criteria. We think very carefully about the problem we're trying to solve. Again, when you're working against impossibility theorems, you have to do this. But in general, we, we try and have a dialogue with policymakers to understand what they want and build a mechanism around their goals that will also do things like improve incentives and market efficiency. And then this one's really important and I think doesn't get enough attention. It's often very good if you have a basic framework and set of design principles but you can sort of give them as a package to somebody else and say, okay, you know, pick and choose from this. So in school choice systems, we leave the politicians slash school boards the power to decide how priorities are going to be allocated. We tell them a lot of information about what the allocation of priorities should do to outcomes, but they have that flexibility to make changes, to give priority to people with siblings in the same school if they want, or people in the walk zone to reduce busing costs. And that's actually really important. So having a mechanism instead, you know, for whatever priority structure you want to give us, we can give you a good outcome, that's useful. People like that because they, both they feel like they have control and in some sense they do. They can actually adjust the mechanism on their own to more effectively reflect their own policy goals. Yeah. Is this, so market thickness, is this something that's required for market design to work, or is this just you're setting it as a goal? It's a good question. Sort of both. So sometimes thin markets do work. Markets often work better when they're thick. So it's, it's both. When we design a market, we'd like it to be one that encourages participation. Actually, the example for this I always give is dating markets. Right. So I was thinking, like, you know, we've created markets for pollution, mm -hmm. say. So this is actually a place where you might want to promote thinness. Yeah. What exactly do you mean by that? Well, they've created markets to trade, like, uh, you know, you have the right to pollute a little bit your, your factory or something, right? But at the same time, society kind of want, did this to, to reduce pollution, right? So there's a difference between thinness of the market and sort of thinness of the, the usage, right? So a lot of these pollution markets are about trading credits. We've set some total cap on the amount of pollution we want to be able to create, and we're trying to figure out the efficient way of distributing it. So in the pollution markets, we actually have this big international problem where we want all of the countries to sign into the same pollution market in some sense. But many of them won't, and we don't have any way to enforce it. So thickness here would mean having all of the participants playing in the mechanism in the existing trading system rather than some of them playing outside. And so in fact, in that example, getting the market to be really thick you know, would mean that in fact we'd, we'd have our cap as a, uh, as a sustainable and enforceable thing. 
Whereas when some people exit the mechanism and go outside of it, they could you know, pollute all they want because we can't enforce anything on them. That said, so there, so there I think we would want to be encouraging thickness. And the idea of the market mechanism is sort of to con has as one of its constraints the amount of pollution you're going to allow. That said, uh, I started to say dating markets. We often try and think of these online dating platforms as ways to thicken a very thin market, which is the market of people meeting each other, you know, sitting in coffee shops. <laughs> Didn't actually intend that to be too funny, but okay. That one I did. Um, I wonder if I iterate this, will it work? <laughs> Apparently so. Okay, good to know. <laughs> uh, far too big for the margin of this talk to explain. In any event, these dating markets, many of them, the goal is to be thick. Some of them start with the premise that they'd like to be a little bit thinner. So Match.com is sort of this huge, gigantic, you know, shambling dating market that has lots and lots of people in it. And you guys all have econometric experience. When you have sort of a large distribution of people on the site, you draw one at random, what does that person look like? <laughs> I hear some laughter, but no one's actually giving the answer. What's the answer? Average. Average, good. So you draw someone at random from Match.com, and they more or less look like the mean of the population distribution, which, while it's great for the vast majority of the distribution, does absolutely nothing for either tail. And so there are people who set out to create sites that try and exclude members who aren't on one tail or the other. And there actually are ones for both tails. The problem with these markets is that sort of the forced thinness makes them very hard to scale. Right? It's very hard to get enough people from the right tail to sign up for dating websites. So uh, I think every time I've gotten a degree from Harvard, I've gotten another email inviting me to join Ivy Date. Um, I don't know anybody, you know, all of my friends presumably got these two. I study dating websites to some extent. We've all talked about them. I don't think anyone has joined this Ivy Date site. And so by trying to constrain itself to be thin, it may actually be too thin to get anyone to participate. So there's this weird sort of trade-off between the two in that setting. But generally, and certainly for examples where it's going to be sort of a public political mandate like school choice, we like thickness. We don't want it to be the case that everyone is going to walk out of the system and say, either go to private schools or just try and contract with the public schools independently. Uh, so, as an aside, that was what was going on in New York before. So before the redesign of the New York uh, high school matching system, the schools were actually holding out huge fractions of their seats, like a third of their seats, for people who would get bad allocations in the actual mechanism and then would call their local principal and say, hey, I live next door to you. Can't I go to your school? And they were all doing this. And so there was an existing market, but it wasn't really thick in the sense that nobody actually was participating in it. OK. But very good question. You know, the thickness is going to be one of the biggest tensions throughout all of this. You know, for, for school choice, we really are going to need everybody to play the system, play in the system. They're not playing it. They're not gaming it. But other places, it's a real tension. How much do you want the individual rationality, the sort of entry constraint, to bind relative to other things you'd like to do with the mechanism. Actually, we'll talk about that with eminent domain. That's a big deal. OK, so that's market design. Any more questions before we start in on school choice? I just want to understand if there is really a market, a matching market for ugly people. That's kind of what you said. A matching market for ugly people? Yeah, is there a reason you might be interested in that? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> for, the purpose, for the purpose of the Morning. The first question was, I want to understand if there's really a matching market for ugly people. The second question was, is there a reason you might be interested in that in particular? Uh, so no, I, I like to believe that most of the dating websites are not just picture image contests. I don't actually know that. I don't you know, know how people use these things at that level. That said, there are dating sites for groups of people that you sort of aren't very thick and aren't necessarily desirable by the majority of the people using the dating site market. So for example, their dating sites only target substantially older people. Like they're dating sites for like baby boomers on their third marriages. Hmm? <laughs> substantially, I said. Um, <laughs> I'm not touching the peanut gallery in that corner. Um, 
And so things like that, you know, those are, these are really very specialized sites that are out, you know, in one dimension, they're you know, a tail of the distribution that, that people, the, the mean people on Match.com aren't interested at all in it all, right? The mean people on Match.com might be very interested in people with you know, 15 PhDs. Those people are like, you know, in finance jobs, those people are likely to be great providers, but the people with the 15 PhDs in finance jobs probably aren't interested in the Match.com people. But there are these. So there, there's a huge number of dating sites out there. Uh, this is not a talk about dating sites, but I, I do sometimes give one of those. In order to prepare for that, I created fake accounts on a number of them and, you know, and like looked at the distributions. Um, there are more of these than you can imagine. We'll leave it at that. OK, good. School choice. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yes. So the, the examples that you've delivered so far have all been sort of that one's you know, bilateral matching yes. markets. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't know. I suppose the, the sense you gave about market, what market design was seems like far broader. But I, you know, I don't suppose yep. if I'm writing a paper in empirical I.O. and I come to some conclusion about you know this is the optimal you know uh, tax structure or, or whatever. <coughs> You know, that is incentive compatible and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call that market design. Or, I mean, I think maybe it's a little bit persnickety, but I want to know, like, <laughs> I don't know. OK, so you're not being persnickety at all. You know, this is, I gave this grand outlook view. The grand outlook view is the way I think about economics. And I think about optimal taxation as, as at least to the extent that people want to apply it as being in sort of the same general tradition. I don't think any market designer would be imperialistic enough to claim that you know, all of that optimal tax literature, that was really part of us all the time. Um, that said, it's more a way about, of thinking about economic problems. Like it's almost, you know, it's the engineering approach to economics. I happen to think a lot about matching markets. And so lots of the examples and good stories I have come from the world of matching, although this eminent domain work I've been a part of and is not about matching. It's really more about auctions uh, to a certain extent. But thus far, market design as a, as a formal field has thought mostly about auctions and matching theory. These have sort of been the two big spurs. And then there are other things. There's design of internet reputation mechanisms, you know, sort of this, this additional corner. But mostly, those are the two monoliths of the things that have been done by people who are sort of actively thinking of themselves as market designers and trying to do all components of that chain. But that said, you know. It's, I hope you guys will think of this as a way of viewing economics and that I'm going to present to you an example that shows you that thinking about economics in this way can be useful and not view it as sort of, you know, you guys should all go off and write papers on school choice. In fact, there are tons of papers that have been written on school choice. And what I'd, I'd love for someone to show us things like, you know, that look more like taxation interacted with the, the market design approach. So cool. Ready to, uh, to move on to the example? Cool. All right, school choice. So what's the setting? We're talking about centralized mechanisms for matching students to K through 12 schools predominantly. Uh, some other countries use similar mechanisms to match students to colleges, public universities. There's a, a lot of this sort of thing going on in Turkey and elsewhere. But for now, we're going to stay in the US and we're going to stay K through 12. The students, by which we really mean their parents, but because the literature said it's the students, we're going to speak of it as being the students. The students are the strategic agents. This is you guys possibly about to enter first grade being strategic. Uh, but you know, think of it when, you, when you're trying to imagine how the students are doing this, think of this as parents. The seats are the goods, and the students each only want one seat. So you only go to one public school. And this, as I mentioned, this flexibility component, priorities at schools are actually exogenous. So in the doctor hospital match, the hospitals have opinions about which doctors they get. In the school choice matching, most of the time, so, so standard public elementary schools do not care which students they get. You know, the, so long as you satisfy whatever global priority goal the school system had, they're happy. All right, some notation. I promise we won't use too much notation today, but this will just help us formalize what our actual goals are. So let's call the set of students I, the set of schools C. And every student is going to have a preference ranking over schools. So this is a single linear order. Schools, meanwhile, are going to have linear priority orders over students. So they have a ranking of students. And again, this is set by the policymakers. And each school has some total maximum capacity. So thus far, we have no quotas or anything like that. It's just the total capacity of the school. 
a match, simple enough. It's going to be an assignment of students to schools. We're going to require that matches actually re respect capacity, so you can't match more students to a school than its capacity. Yep? How should we think about the priority right that schools have over students? OK, good question. I should have uh, given this in more detail. Right, so usually um, there are two big uh, blocks. There's walk zone and non-walk zone. But the standard models all require strict preferences. And so this is this huge indifference class. The schools are different between everyone who doesn't cost more bus money and indifferent between everyone who does. Maybe, maybe with some gradation by distance, but the school systems don't even usually add that. And so what you have to do is you have to randomly tie break all the students in the same indifference class. There are some nice theorems on that sort of say these random tiebreakers are ex-ante fair in different ways. But you can, in principle, use any priority ordering if you want, that you wanted. So if the schools wanted to give everyone the, highest prior, you know, everyone the highest priority if they have blonde hair, they could do that. In practice, we don't, think that's, uh, we don't tend to run into school systems that have that as one of their criteria. Um, instead, it's more about walk zone, non-walk zone, or sometimes also siblings. So if you have a sibling and you're in the walk zone, if you have a sibling and you're in the non-walk zone, they let you, uh, you know, get additional priority for having a sibling at the school. Although some of my friends have said they'd rather have additional priority to go to any other school, but that's, uh, that's an aside. The other thing to think about here The other thing to think about here is you could, and you often will, find these priorities at the places like exam schools in New York driven by test scores. So the priorities in the standard model have to be the same within a school. So uniform within school, but could be non-uniform, so they can vary uh, across schools. So if you think about this walk zone thing, it had better be that way, because if you're in the walk zone for one school, you're not necessarily in the walk zone for a school that's 20 miles away. Uh, but it's the same, it's one strict order within the school, so it's just a single pi c. But it might vary tremendously across schools. Yeah? I was interested in, and maybe if you'll talk about this later, feel free to plan on this. But you can tell us about the timing, because I mean, I'm under the impression that students approach schools, and so like, the students have information about the universe of schools, but the schools don't necessarily have full information about the universe of students. So that, that's kind of like where I was going with this question. So you're going to talk about the timing. I see. So the timing, think of all of this. We're doing design at the time after the priorities have been set, and the students are about to file to the school system a, a ranking of the schools they would like to go to. In fact, that's the next, uh, the next click. So a mechanism, given submitted preferences, the students are going to mail in, you know, here's my ranking over schools. And then something is going to happen that takes as input the priorities and the students' rankings and assigns students to schools. OK? That's the timing. But they've already taken all of their exams. That is important. OK. So first thing, you know, b very basic design goal. If we didn't have this, we'd kind of be in trouble. We want to stop the students from wanting to drop out. We only want to assign people to schools that they find acceptable. A little bit more subtle, we'd also like to eliminate justified envy. So this means that if I envies J, then J had better have higher priority than I at J's assigned school. So if I, want, if I wish I could trade with J, it had better be the case that not only does J not want to trade with me, but that the school you know, prefers J under its priority order. It's, it's, it has more desire. Maybe J's in the walk zone and I'm in the non-walk zone. Oh, sorry. Uh, other thing on elimination of justified envy. This is classically called stability. And I'm going to use these terms interchangeably throughout today and tomorrow. Stability also at times absorbs the individual rationality because you can add a school that's called being unmatched. Again, I'll absorb that in when it's convenient. When we talk about wanting stability in the market, that basically means that we don't want people to try and contract outside. So if you think about it, if we haven't eliminated justified envy, you could get on the phone and call your second choice school after being assigned your third choice and have the second choice school say, oh, yeah, I'll just kick out Jay. You know, you've got higher priority than him. You should come over here. And similarly, so that's, that's a way in which the market is unstable. It would sort of fall apart after we made the assignment. And similarly, this, uh, this individual rationality con uh, component, if people are just going to like quit the school system willy-nilly after the assignment, that's also sort of an 
instability in the market. So stability is going to unify all of these ideas. Yeah? So envy formally just means if you, prior, if you prefer J's assignment, so mu of J, to your assignment. So it's, it's you wish you could trade places with J. Wouldn't that be nice? It has to be the case that if you try, the school will say no. This is, this is essentially why I set out the notation. Most of today's talk is not going to be a notation, but somehow this concept and this one are easier with it. Strategy proofness, I've said before, truthfulness is dominant. This just means that revealing your true preference relation is better than revealing some other preference relation. Uh, and in fact, you know, it could be for any opponent's input. So you know, I guess I should make that like P negative I hat or something to mean that it, it's independent of their choice of input. This is technically formally correct, but not necessarily as clear as it could be. Pareto efficiency, another thing we like. So this is, these are, we're in an ordinal preference domain. So most of the time, we'll only be thinking about Pareto efficiency concepts. And then finally, and we won't talk too much about this today, but it's often the case that we want a school choice mechanism to respect improvements in priority. So what does this mean? This means that if your priority goes up unambiguously, so if you move up in school's priority rankings and nobody else changes, your outcome should improve. Right? This is a pretty natural sounding thing. right? We, we give you strictly higher priority. You do better on your tests. Then you should get a better school. Turns out that not every mechanism that exists in practice actually satisfies this property. Again, it's, it's sort of had a lesser component in the debate, so we'll just sort of flag it when it's relevant. But you know, another design goal for school choice that's been sort of part of the classical literature, like it goes back to the very first paper on school choice, is this respective improvements component. OK, so these are, yeah? Instability and efficiency, Yes. <laughs> so the question was, are stability and Pareto efficiency interrelated somehow? The answer is yes. The, the sub-answer is not in the way you'd like. <laughs> They're essentially mutually exclusive. So we have this the backdrop, this uh, nice theorem. There are, there are about three different impossibility theorems that are the backdrop for school choice. I like this one of Owner Keston's the, the most. There is no Pareto efficient and strategy proof mechanism that always selects a match that is both Pareto efficient and stable whenever such a match exists. So a stable match is not necessarily Pareto efficient. It might be sometimes. You can't write down a matching mechanism which will always find that one if there is one. That's really scary, right? That means that efficiency and stability are going to be in formal conflict for everything we're doing today. Can you provide some intuition for that? Provide some intuition for that result. No, it's not. This is, this is all complete information, so it's, it's very much not that. No, no, you have ordinal information. That's paucity. Oh, sorry, paucity of information in that sense? Yeah, that's yeah so that's, 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 that's more or less right. Um, to give a sharper, so a sharper statement of what's going on. Well, it's a little, let me, let me show you the, the deferred acceptance, the stable matching mechanism, which is the next slide, and then I'll be able to give a slightly better answer to this question. Because it has to do with sort of stability rules out all blocks. This has to do with blocks that don't actually matter, if that makes any sense. OK, so how do we get stable outcomes? This is the standard answer. This is more or less the same mechanism that appeared in the Gail Shapley 1962 paper. So. We call it the student optimal stable mechanism, also deferred acceptance. Each student applies to his first choice school. And then each school tentatively holds its highest priority applicants up to capacity and rejects everyone else. So you think about this, the schools are lined up on one side of the room. Everyone walks over and proposes to their favorite school. The schools collect their best bundle and reject everyone else. Now, if you live in most school districts, one school just got tons and tons of proposals and had to make tons of rejections. Well, now everyone who's been rejected, who's been rejected goes and proposes to their second choice. So that's the next step. So anyone who's not currently being held applies to his or her most preferred school. And then again, the schools hold their best quotas number of acceptable students. OK, so there are finally many schools in most school districts. Nobody laughed at that one. There are finally many schools in most school districts. And 
the students are constantly moving down their preference relations. As a result, what we know is that at some point, this algorithm has to terminate. Right? You know, we can only make finitely many proposals. I claim that at the time at which this algorithm terminates, if we match the students to the schools that are tentatively holding them, then we have a stable match. OK, well, fact one, no one's proposed to a school that they find unacceptable, and no school has held a student that it finds unacceptable. So there's none of this you know, unilateral dropout. And meanwhile, suppose there were some justified envy. So there's a school that I like that wants me. Well, I should have proposed to it earlier than to my current match. And if it wants me, instead of one of its current students, it should have held me at that time. So that's a contradiction. So we can't have either of these you know, stability problems going on. Strategy proofness comes a little bit more difficultly, but it comes out of the structure of stable outcomes. It turns out that sort of there's alignment of interests, and there's a unique best for students stable outcome. That's why it's called the student optimal stable outcome. Yes? Oh. Um, and so this, this alignment of interests guarantees that it's optimal for students to reveal their preferences truthfully. Uh, the impossibility theorem would better tell us that this isn't Pareto efficient. The question was, what's going on with Pareto efficiency? So I still feel like what I should really do is just add to tomorrow's slides a copy of the simple example, because I'm not going to be able to reproduce it off the top of my head. It has a, it's a reasonably large, simple example. But essentially what's going on is that during this algorithm, you might knock out students by going to schools that you won't end up at in the end. And that's where, the, that's where the inefficiencies are coming from. So like, you'll essentially prevent potential Pareto trades by blocking, a, uh, by blocking a match and then leaving the school and going somewhere else. So you block a match at a place you'll eventually get kicked out of. And then later, the person who goes there uh, you know, could trade with the person who you kicked out. So it's like, let me see if I can draw a diagram. Do I need? OK, so I'm here. And somebody comes in and kicks me out. So uh, oh, I was going to do Stephen, but that's, uh, that's another S. So, uh, so Durloff comes and kicks me out. And so now I go over here and take this position. So now later, you know, maybe I kick out Jim who kicks out Durloff. But really, you know, so Durloff never actually takes this position. But Jim and I want to trade. I'd rather be here, and he'd rather be here. It's just I have higher priority than he does, and he has higher priority than I do. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're, you're over here. Um, and so Durloff sort of never ended up at this school, but stopped this efficient uh, this efficient allocation whereby Jim was here and I was here simply by kicking me out and forcing the trade. Do you see what's going on? Yeah. So this wouldn't be a problem if, uh, if all schools were using a, a, a pretty similar, uh, the same ranking system for people. That's right. So, this, so the ranking system plays into this a lot. So uniform ranking is easier. Uh, you have a question? Or go ahead. So I don't really understand. So what does it mean to hold its highest priority applicants? So let's say you had two schools and three students, and everybody had to rank two highest. And that, let, let's say there are three students. Mm -hmm. Oh, this doesn't work. Just, okay. Let's say you have four students, okay. and two want to go this way, and the other two want to go the other way to the yep. other school. But then each school can only rank one individual as its highest. So they, highest they, they rank the one highest, and then there are the two left who then have to go to their no, no, no. second. No, very, very good question. So highest, highest priority up to capacity. So if your capacity is five, you take the five highest priority applicants you received. Yes. Oh, sorry. Are they taken? No, no, it goes on. So you, you, you don't, you only finalize the assignment at the end. Yes. What happens if, let's say there are 10 schools, mm -hmm. and they only want my child to go to one of three schools, and if my child is matched at one of three schools, I drop out. Like, how do we account for that? So you list on your preference relation only those three schools, and then the last, you know, and then if you don't end up assigned to the mechanism, it tells you you didn't get matched, and then you go to a private school or something like that. So you always have the freedom to not list a school that you don't want to go to, and you just may not end up being matched. 
would that would that come against greater efficiency or like what's the does that count against efficiency? I'd have to think about that. I don't know. In the sense that, like, let's say somebody gets matched at school number three, mm -hmm. they would have been fine going to school number four, but I would have totally not been fine going to school mm -hmm. number four. So that doesn't that doesn't count against Pareto efficiency because they have to prefer three to four to end up there before four, right? If you're being unmatched, so it's unlikely. So only if like two different people, you know, if somehow the mechanism unmatches someone who'd like to remain matched and matches someone who doesn't want to remain matched, do you have a Pareto trade between them? But if people only list acceptable schools, you shouldn't ever have someone matched who doesn't want to remain matched. Yeah. I have a really simple clarifying question. Sure. Um, so in step one, everybody goes to their preferred schools. In step two, mm -hmm. do schools kick out people who are no longer as preferred when the set and next round come in? Yes. That's what's, happening. Okay, that's what's going on. That's why, it's, that's why it's tentative holding. We don't finalize until the end. Does everyone understand? Cool. Good. <laughs> yes. yes. Now, at the end, if, if uh, it was suddenly, unexpectedly, uh, Unex un unanticipated, the school district allows all of the students to uh, start training with each other. Uh, also a good question. We'll come back to that. Okay. But, yeah. um, so in your example here, I was wondering, is that because you're only taking into account the utility of the students? Does anything change if you think that there's some, there's some underlying utility of the schools? Yes. So I haven't talked about it here, and we probably won't have time to go into it in any detail. But if you think that the school system is maximizing some general goal, first of all, this is not the mechanism you want to use, usually. So for example, there's work in San Francisco where they're trying to maximize the diversity of all of the schools at once. So sort of the, the second you have students of one type of ethnic background in a school, you want to assign students of the same ethnic background to other schools until they sort of equalize. There are, and there's a different mechanism you want to use for that. And it turns out that there are all sorts of impossibility theorems surrounding the degree to which you can do that without creating incentives for misrepresentation. But yes, so that's, that's a different and hard question. And we don't have good answers yet. So if you're interested, let's talk offline. And I can tell you the state of the literature. Yep. Oh, sorry. I, right. I made the common mistake of calling the person behind the person in the same line of sight. Julia, why don't you go first? I'm just a little confused. When you said that if the student is placed in the early three schools that are going to go to and they opt for a private school, mm -hmm. is that not a violation of the participation constraint? So that's not a violation of the participation constraint in the sense that we're not assigning anyone to a school they find unacceptable. Right? It is, it, we'd like it to be the case that everyone wanted to go to public schools in the area, but it turns out that a lot of them don't. Uh, the idea here, we're going to try and make the matching of students to their public schools as stable or efficient, depending on our design goal, as possible within the constraint that some people may leave the system if they're unmatched. Is that? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, so, I mean, OK, so the arrow is the only other possibility here that I have in mind. But it's, gonna, it, it's required there that I have a person with, I need, I need a full set of realizable preferences for the result to go through, right? Or maybe there are generalizations in which that doesn't hold, but right. like in the classic. Uh, so the answer is you do need some preference th uh, freedom for all of these impossibilities as well. Yeah. They're not particularly pathological. So most of the impossibility results floating around the two-sided matching literature work for very natural preferences. Uh, so for example, the impossibility that's going on here, you know, this basically just comes out of the fact that you know, Jim and I disagree about which school is the best, and Stephen kind of likes this one. Right, you know, sort of this. This is a this is a very replicable example. It's not like it sort of involves like you know Stephen wanting to vote for an outcome only when it disagrees with Jim. Like, okay, cool. All right, so that's deferred acceptance. We uh, we stable pun, sort of in, unintended. Good. Okay, so one other mechanism, and again, if we only get through the de definitions of these mechanisms today, is that today that'll be totally fine. Like, it, this is seeing the distinction between these two is really important. So again, like, let's spend as much time as we need to get what's going on with this alternative. So this is called the Boston mechanism. The reason for this is that it's been used in Boston school choice and was up until pretty recently. Each student applies to her, his first choice school. And now, remember last time we had this holding. So we, we had this discussion of whether, whether they finalize the, the assignments then. Now we do. So each school actually accepts its highest priority applicants up to capacity and rejects everybody else. Okay, big distinction. 
So now we iterate every not yet accepted student applies to his next choice, and again, the school accepts its higher priority applicant. So by contrast, this mechanism is Pareto efficient, but it's neither stable nor strategy proof. So strategy proofness, that's the one that's gonna matter here. Why isn't this mechanism strategy proof? Good, was it? Well, if you're better than all the, if you're better than all the people who have as their first choice, your second choice, but you're not better than all the people who have your first choice as their first choice, yep. you don't your second choice. Right, so what Elizabeth said is that if there's a lot of competition, you know, a lot of people are going to beat you out for your first choice, but you're better than all the people who want your second choice first, you should list your second choice first. Does everybody see that? Okay. That's exactly what's wrong with this mechanism. And in fact, when run, it generally has the property that, you know, your fifth choice is the highest choice that's free if you don't get your listed first choice. So meanwhile, despite this, it's extraordinarily popular in practice. So why do politicians like this mechanism and often come up with it on their own? Freedom. Hmm? Freedom. Freedom? Simple. Simple, OK. But what's particularly good about this mechanism? What can you put on the front of the paper? Oh, it lets students get their third choice. Right. So if everyone plays the strategy correctly, everyone's going to get their first choice. Because you're all going to rank as your first choice the school you get in equilibrium. And in fact, that's what happens. So when you use the Boston mechanism, lots and lots and lots of people get their first choice, and it looks great. Well, except what's going on? So the schools have to tell you. The school systems actually tell you that these first choices, you know, sort of a little bit of an issue. So in the Boston Public Schools you know, submit, you know, manual, the thing that explains how the mechanism works, in 2004 it said, for a better choice of your first choice school, consider choosing less popular schools. You know, what? <laughs> so Boston is telling the parents that they need to strategize. OK, well, the St. Petersburg Times figured out it even before then. So make a realistic, informed selection of the school you list as your first choice. It's the cleanest shot you will get at a school, but if you aim too high, you might miss. Why? They can explain the strategy. Because you fall in line behind everyone who wanted your second choice school as their first choice. OK. Well, so this is all over the St. Petersburg News. They were using this mechanism as well. This mechanism was extremely widespread. It was actually the most used school choice mechanism in the world. OK, well, how about the Boston parents? Well, it turns out that the West Zone Parents Group, this is like a particular parents union, got together and jointly collected the data they needed to strategize optimally. <laughs> Our school choice strategy is to find a school you like that is undersubscribed and put it as a top choice, or Find a school that you like that is popular and put it as a first choice, and find a school that's less popular as a safe second choice. And again, to, to optimize your strategy, you need information about what applications other people are filing and what previous, uh, previous application numbers were. And they collected all of this and had meetings. <laughs> Sounds a little bad. Right? Like, you know, people are figuring out how to strategize against this mechanism. You, know, you guys figured it out in you know, 20 seconds. You might think that the random population wouldn't figure it out and you could just sort of run it and you'd get true data. But in fact, not so much. Yeah. Um, can you talk a bit about going back to the first mechanism of the cost involved in terms of like, everybody postulating and then nobody holding? Because in a sense, there's kind of like an efficiency loss. And say, if I'm somebody who has like, a low threshold for like, hassle factor or ah. something like that. Do I get screwed in the first mechanism? Sorry, I should, have, I should have been more clear about this. All of these mechanisms are just, you should think of as algorithms. There's a computer in the school system that runs it. So you don't actually actively apply to any school. You hand them a preference list, and they just run this algorithm, and it takes under a minute. So there's no, there's no like time and waiting and agony cost. As an aside, some places try and run these algorithms in decentralized fashions. In fact, for a while, the medical match was doing a version of that. Those do have some agony cost associated with them. Uh, but I still think the, the outcomes would be much better than under Boston, even once you account for that sort of time waiting. Do you have a question as well? Yeah, I have a question. I still don't really get why the first strategy was uh, strategy approved. Ah. So, so for example, um, if I'm, like let's say there are three types of schools, the best, the middle, and the worst. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of a middle type guy. So I apply to the middle one, and I'm helped because they think I might be but then for some reason, 
more people apply to the better school than the better school can take, and then those guys get to the middle school, but then they kind of get me out of there, mm -hmm. and then, oh, okay, then I just move down, or right. I can kick out the next person, is that how it works? Yes. So I don't move like to a private, but I would move to the third, that's my question. You, you move to whatever the next thing on your preference list is. So if you, per, right, so if you prefer the third, you know, the, the low quality school to the private school, you move to that. Right, it's not like you then quit. You can come back and repropose. Okay, there's been enough question about this. I should, I should go back and make sure we really have this deferred acceptance thing carefully. All right. So everyone applies to their first choice schools. The schools hold. They're sort of tentatively accepting, but not actually accepting their best collection of students with respect to priorities. Then e reject everyone else, and everyone who's been rejected reapplies to their second choice school, assuming they have a second acceptable school. Okay? And then again, the schools hold their best acceptable set. Some people they'd held the first time might be rejected now because some really desirable student might have you know, gone and you know, come back and applied to you now after being rejected from his first choice. And so at every stage, everyone who's been rejected proposes again if they want to. OK? Cool. And then we only finalize the matches at the end. Sorry, yeah. can you explain again why strategy improvements is a really important thing. Yes, that's the, that's the next slide here. OK, uh, sorry, yeah, before we... we... Um, so it, it's the stability. Um, uh, OK, so um, <laughs> the, the st you said it's not stable, the Boston mechanism. Yeah, sorry, what's the question? You said the Boston mechanism is not stable. Correct. Um, which implies if I remember correctly, that uh, I would like to exchange, if I'm in that system, it's possible that I want to exchange places with Stephen. Correct. Um, and, the, and the school that has taken Stephen will take you instead. Right, so you, you, you might always right. want to exchange with someone. Yeah, 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 it's, it's, okay. Got it? Okay. And he, he obviously doesn't want to exchange with me. It's, it's, Correct. Uh, right, okay. That's, that's what the great efficiency is. Right, okay, yeah. yes, that, that's what I was going Personal. Yeah. <laughs> and just intuitively, it seems like schools do pretty well here because they ultimately can veto students. Whereas if you reverse it and say, like, if schools submit their list of the students that they want and parents have the power to reject, mm -hmm. would students be better off than in this version of the game? Interesting. So that's a very good question, although I think you have the intuition a little bit flipped. So it turns out that there is actually a set of stable matchings in general, it's not just one of them. And there's sort of a student optimal. So we call this the student optimal stable matching mechanism. Uh, so it better be that it chooses the student optimal one. And then there's actually like a lattice of these things all the way down to a school optimal one. So in the doctor hospital match, say, where the, where the hospitals are strategic players, there's actually a very deep design question about whether you want to pick the hospital optimal one, which is in fact is the doctor pessimal, or the doctor optimal one, which is hospital pessimal. So it's always the case that the, the proposing side is best off and that the one that is best for one side is worst for the other in, in these sort of simple matching mechanisms, ma matching models. There are more generalized models in which this theorem breaks down in certain fairly technical ways. But for everything we're talking about today, sort of the student optimal stable match is if the priorities were preferences, the school pessimal match. Worst. 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 Yes. Yeah, definition of pessimal is worst. Um, but yeah, so that's, we're going to abstract away from that for all of the discussion today because here the schools really are not strategic players. And, you know, and only the student optimal stable mechanism is strategy proof for the students. Also, in large markets, there are some theorems that show that with very high probability, there's actually only one match. Sort of this whole lattice collapses to a point. But you're right, this is an important design issue to think about. Yes? It's a, when, just a common, like when we're talking about problems with the Boston mechanism, mm -hmm. like are you going to talk about fairness at all? So in the sense that, you know, we're yes. assuming that everyone has the same cognitive cost and can figure out the... We're going, we're go it's exactly where we're going. So, so per that and the why do we care about strategy proofness again question are exactly the right transition. Thank you. Okay, so some parents aren't good at strategizing. That was, that was the last question, right? So we're going to assume these unsophisticated parents just submit truthfully. 
And this is, uh, you know, this is natural default behavior, and we also have a lot of experimental and anecdotal evidence that suggests that this is true. And so meanwhile, we're going to let the sophisticated students best respond. So what happens? Guesses? Yeah. So the sophisticated students are substantially more likely to get what they want. So Parag and Typhoon, Parag Patak and Typhoon Sunmeds have this great paper. Uh, it's the only other one I strongly suggested you guys read ex ante. So hopefully most of you have glanced at it. It says, under the Boston mechanism in equilibrium, the sincere students are basically losing their priorities to the sophisticated students. The ones who play the optimal strategy are just stealing schools from the sincere students. And moreover, the sophisticated students never lose priority to each other. So best responding allows you to react to the people around you. And this might cause some chaos in the sincere students' allocations because they might get priority at the expense of other sincere students. Meanwhile, uh, there's some coordination required. There are multiple equilibria, and so they need, the sophisticates need to coordinate their equilibria. But if, assuming they manage to do that, then they actually prefer the outcome under Boston to the outcome under the student optimal stable mechanism. So they're not just gaining you know, relative to the performance of the sincere students, but they're actually gaining relative to you know, other, you know, sort of, other systems with better incentives. Did you have a question? Maybe. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> okay, I, I might have an answer. I'm thinking about, like, if I don't get my first choice, mm -hmm. is that really considered like, winning? I mean, I may get my second or third choice. I, I know we're thinking, oh, if I don't want to go to any of these other schools, I'm just not going to put them on my list. So, but if I'm putting down my second choice and my first choice because there's going to be a lot of competition. Right. I really would rather go to this other school. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's, so we're not going to talk about it today, although it has a bullet point on one of these slides that's coming up that says, look, there are two different ways your first and second choice could differ, right? This is one and this is two, or this is one and this is two. It's like one of these ophthalmologist appointments. One, two, one, two. The marginal cost of sending this guy to a second in terms of efficiency is pretty low. The marginal cost in this guy is really high. We'd like this guy to go to the second choice school, if, assuming they have the same actual schools, just different marginal utility losses. Turns out that there's some evidence that at least in very specific stylized models, Boston can sort of incentivize. This guy's more likely to go to, the, to, to end up in the second choice school. So there is some way in which, you know, when you bring in cardinal information, there might be a little bit of value to Boston. but. I tend to think, and we've mostly decided that that's eclipsed by the fact that the, you know, the sophisticates are doing a really good job at the expense of all of the sincere students. Uh, a bunch of questions. We'll start in. Just yep. I do that there's a question on the table, and it's a good point because you just mentioned cardinal information. Yep. You haven't talked about any in a personal, well, you have implicitly in a personal discussion. So, what is behind the results? In other words, is there a paucity of information? Remember that? Impossibility. Yeah, so I, I, under, I understand the basic question, but I don't under, or I understand the basic issue, but I don't understand the question. What is behind the results in what what's sense? The intuition, the original question was what's the intuition of the impossibility result? Oh. Um, there are intuitions for many impossibility mm -hmm. results, including errors, the ones in the end no, so it, zero. Right. So I, I gave I thought I gave this explanation. So it's it's not about paucity of information. Uh, you didn't see you didn't see the example about uh, Stephen and Jim? Yes, I did. You did okay. So it's not about, I don't believe it's about paucity of information. It's just about the fact that we're allowed, by ruling out all possible blocks, it's, it's not that we, we don't know whether Stephen values going to the school more or less than I do, but rather just by allowing him to block my going to the school at all, you know, sort of for, for, any, for any utility value, which, you know, he has higher priority there. So even if he has low utility, you know, we allow him to do or low marginal disutility of, of being kicked out, he kicks me out but doesn't actually end up here. Okay, so that's that particular mechanism. What about another mechanism that works well? I'm, not, I'm still not sure I entirely understand the question then. So we, you know, this mechanism is going to be Pareto efficient. And as I said, it will allow us to get some cardinal information, but has these major strategy proofness problem, problems. Well, I guess like what you're saying that like in this in this particular case, mm -hmm. both don't doesn't hold. But I think what you were saying is like why can't we think of yeah. any possible case for both like So all I was showing is that stability and Pareto efficiency are in, in some fashion in conflict, right? 
And so this is an instance where stability and Pareto efficiency are going to be in conflict, and that's the intuition of what's generating that conflict throughout. Yeah, this is, this, is, this is, I can't claim it's the only thing that does it, but this is one example of something that does it in the context of the impossibility, in, that underlies the impossibility result. Yes. So if I had perfectly comparable information, <coughs> partial data information on, on all of this, and I had... Uh, yeah, so it's even if you had partial data, 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 and I optimized, and, you know, so would I be able to get to a, a, a social ranking or, a, you know, something that would be uh, a way of implementing things that would be better and stable? So when you have cardinal data, stability, uh, stable outcomes generally are efficient. So if you allow people to actually, oh, okay. right. So I'm not, so again, I'm, this is sort of, these, these, these impossibilities sort of live in the ordinal world. Um, but you do have to allow people to make transfers. You can't just have cardinal utility and then generate the ordinal preferences. You know, if you, so one way of interpreting your question is if I give you cardinal information and then extract people's preferences, you know, Will this appear? The answer is yes. If I give people, if you give, you give me cardinal information and let people pay each other, no. Okay. So you actually get full efficiency in stable outcomes when you allow transfers, but that's sort of a different problem, partially because it's a different class of problems, and more for this circumstance because we don't usually let people pay each other to go to good schools. Okay. Um, Really quickly, go ahead. Um, have you uh, said why the Boston mechanism is unstable yet? Have I said why the Boston mechanism is unstable? No, uh, but it's very simple. Suppose you don't end up at your first choice, and your second choice gets filled up. You end up in your fifth choice. You, in fact, could have had your second choice. OK. So this was the major reason for switching from the Boston mechanism to the student optimal stable mechanism in Boston. And in fact, you know, they, they quoted it. So the year after that recommendation in the handbook, uh, they said, you know, a strategy-proof algorithm levels the playing field by diminishing the harm done to parents who do not strategize or do not strategize well. So now we've, we've built up a bunch of theory. We've spent a lot of time gripping it. This is the first time we can see it in application. If we really understand how to make a mechanism strategy-proof, we can equalize individuals' access to the school choice mechanism. And in fact, the uh, West Zone Parents Group uh, protested and lobbied against this change. So we, you know, <laughs> but it still went through. So they now use a version of the, uh, of the student optimal stable mechanism in Boston. OK, so we've talked about New York and we've talked about Boston. Um, both of these economists were involved, you know, Typhoon Sonmez and Al Roth and Attila Abdukhadaroglu uh, you know, and Parag Patak, you know, got together and worked with the city officials to change the mechanisms. Meanwhile, in both England and Chicago, uh, there were existing school choice mechanisms, both you know, based on the Boston mechanism, which were abandoned without anyone talking to economists at all. So the weird thing is they, they actually chose non-strategy-proof mechanisms. They replaced a non-strategy-proof mechanism with a non-strategy-proof mechanism. So very quickly, I'm going, to try and, I'm going to try and sort of generalize the discussion we just saw about strategy-proofness to say how you can think about strategy-proof at, at different levels. OK, so here's the, quickly the story from Chicago. I couldn't believe it, school CEO Ron Huberman said. It's terrible. Well, what was terrible? High-scoring kids were being rejected simply because of the order in which they listed their college prep preferences. So this is, you know, they reported truthfully, and they lost out because they were running a version of the Boston mechanism. Previously, some eighth graders were listing the most competitive college preps as their top choice, foregoing their chances of getting to other schools that would have accepted them if they'd ranked those higher. So. They switched midstream. They, they actually canceled the mechanism and said, all right, we're changing. You can submit new preferences if you'd like. They figured out that some people had been strategizing or probably been strategizing and switched to a version of deferred acceptance. Well, what are they, what's their version? Well, the old one was Boston, except they forced you to pref truncate your preference list. So there are nine of these elite public high schools, and they said you could only rank four of them. They went to deferred acceptance, student optimal stable mechanism, but also with the same truncation down to four. So by the way, do people see why truncation might be bad? Great, okay, good. So this was urgent, this was you know, the, the, you know, all over the Chicago Sun-Times, and yet they chose a mechanism that's still manipulable. So we're gonna go through this very quickly, and I'm not actually gonna 
talk through the formalism too much because the, the formalism is not that important if you're in, uh, for this purpose. If you're interested in it in more detail, go look at this paper. It's uh, Padak Sonmez. It's forthcoming in the AER. They said, well, okay, can we understand is there some way in which the student optimal stable mechanism with truncation is less manipulable than the Boston mechanism with truncation? And the answer turns out to be yes. So essentially, you, you count across instances of preferences, right? So the preferences are the thing that you don't know when you're the mechanism designer. And you say that a mechanism is as manipulable as another mechanism if there's some instance in which the uh, you know, one is manipulable. Sorry, for any instance in which psi is manipulable, phi is also manipulable. And then you can say that phi is more manipulable than psi if whenever phi, psi is manipulable, phi is too. And there's one instance where phi is manipulable and psi is not. And the theorem that they show at the beginning of this paper, it's sort of motivated by this Chicago example, is that the old Chicago mechanism is more manipulable than the new Chicago mechanism. And in fact, not only is that true, but the old Chicago mechanism is extremely manipulable. It's as manipulable as any stable mechanism. And in fact, it's as manipulable as any weakly stable mechanism. So that's you only allow blocks among first choices. So students can only block by moving to their first choice schools. This is a really weak condition. And so we can at least rationalize this behavior. We can say, OK, so now we understand. You know, they, they made some change. Um, the other thing we can do is we can go to them and say, well, look, OK, so you, you guys are doing great. You've, you've successfully made this mechanism less manipulable. This is, this is, helping, the, this is helping the students. Um, but we can also recommend other things. So for example, we can say, well, it turns out that less truncation is good, so allowing them people to submit six schools rather than four is actually even an improvement. So this same partial ordering over mechanisms says that you know, student optimal stable mechanism with truncation to length six is less manipulable than truncation to length four. And so through talking to them, we still don't know why they don't want to let people rank all nine. It's not like New York where there are hundreds of schools under consideration and they truncate you to 12 because they don't want you to try and like actually rank 100 schools. Like it's nine. It seems like they could actually do this. But Nevertheless, you know, they're willing to expand the list. And we can, we can understand and rationalize and think about as market designers, again, moving within constraints. Right? So for some reason they want to do this, we can give them intelligent information that tells them which direction is the right direction to move. OK, so uh, let's see. We talked about this. We talked about requiring truncation is still suboptimal. Uh, last thing, so I mentioned just now that New York truncates you to 12. They also do the same thing in England. So there are lots of different school districts in England. It turns out that a lot of them use the Boston mechanism. But when they noticed that the Boston mechanism had the strategization problem, they didn't just switch. They actually outlawed it. So the Boston mechanism is now illegal. In fact, the whole class it comes from, they're called the first preference first mechanisms, are now illegal in, uh, in England. And so uh, this is quoted from the school admissions code. In setting oversubscription criteria, uh, the admission authorities for all maintained schools must not give priority to children according to the order of other schools named as preferences, including first preference, first arrangements. So you cannot take the submitted preferences sort of, you know, as an input to figuring out, you know, the way in which you're going to, you know, the way in which you're going to fill the ordering. So you can't say, look at everyone's first choice first. Uh, so really the, uh, you know, you can't use it in England. It's now sort of completely illegal. If you find it, you can probably turn it in for a reward or something. Uh, but this is, this is sort of where it's mostly where market designs come down on the Boston mechanism. So we talked about this cardinal thing, you know, this, this component. But mostly, and I'll show you two more cuts of this, Boston turns out to have a lot of problems. So that's the, that's the sort of basic state of school choice. Okay, this is, this is school choice with respect to the original criteria, trying to understand how the interplay of stability and strategy proofness and efficiency work. What we've just seen is that strategy proofness can be a really powerful way to ensure access. And we've also seen that you can, you can talk to school officials about sort of making their mechanism more strategy proof. Let's push it a little further. And this, again, is, you know, it's an interesting interplay between theory and practice, right? So, it's all coming out of, you know, it's all coming purely out of theory, you know, these, these orderings, the ways in which we're thinking about the mechanisms. But 
you can go to practice and people will actually listen to you and take these theorems and, and they help them understand what's going on. Uh, I haven't said, but it's actually very important. A lot of the you know, theoretical explanations, turns out, don't make di sense to policymakers directly. So you guys are all really quick. You instantaneously saw why Boston was manipulable. It actually took people in Boston a really long time to understand this, as best I can tell. I wasn't, I wasn't actually there, so I can't. <laughs> uh, I won't speak to that at all, um, but I'll, I'll take your word on it. <laughs> One thing that's really useful in showing people how these, how these systems are actually going to work in practice is lab experiments. So there are lots of problems with lab experiments in economics, but lab experiments on testing mechanisms both lets you understand what information you need to give participants so that they can figure out what they want to do. And it lets you sort of give a baseline. Like, OK, you know, I gave a very, very simple situation to these people. They played it five times after thinking about it for 10 minutes, and they understood how to manipulate the system. This like really makes things clear to school officials. Moreover, when you're talking about both Boston and New York, you know, everyone in New York says, oh, Boston is nothing like New York. You know, we have different schools. We're a different school system. And Boston says, no, 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 no. We're nothing like New York. You know, New York is, you know, has many more schools than we do. They're talking about high school. We're talking about elementary school. When you say, you know, the lab is a clean setting. It's a setting where sort of everything is, you know, all of the, you know, Michigas that surround the actual school matching programs is stripped out and it's just the mechanism. Being able to see how people behave in that environment actually makes people wake up a lot. And they're like, oh, wow, OK, maybe people actually are manipulating. And then they'll go and look at their own data and say, wow, yeah, it kind of looks, how odd is it that that really bad school is a lot of people's first choice? OK. So that's, that's the sort of early part of the school choice debate. And it's, in some sense, it's what everyone agrees on. There are other things you might want school choice programs to do. And so we're very quickly going to go through a couple examples of that. So first of them, we might want schools to incentivize improvement. The second is we might want pe schools to actually let people choose where they go to school. And the third one, which we won't talk about uh, in any more detail, but I showed you the example over there, we might want to somehow try and incorporate cardinal information. Uh, but first, just one more mechanism. So earlier, who was it? Someone in the right corner. Was it you, who asked, James, who asked about the, uh, the possibility of trading after the mechanism was run? So that's another thing you might want to do. So there's a third school choice mechanism called top trading cycles. And in this mechanism, what you do is you assume, say, that everyone's endowed with their neighborhood school. You can always go to your neighborhood school. And now you let people trade. They all point at their favorite school. And you look for cycles. And if you find a cycle, you rotate it, assign the students, and then pull them out. And you say, OK, here's the, you know, the remaindered market. Again, point, rotate, pull. This is just the formalization of that. It literally says that. Uh, you see, there's the repeat step one part. Uh, this is Pareto efficient and strategy proof. It's not stable in general. You can see where the Pareto efficiency is coming from because we're basically making a lot of Pareto trades. Uh, to answer your question, there's also been a discussion of this thing called stable improvement cycles, which starts with a stable mechanism and then runs sort of a top trading cycles like round at the end. The, the problem with that mechanism is that it's not strategy proof. So if you give people an opportunity to trade after they've been assigned, now they have an incentive to grab the most valuable endowment. So everyone applies to the top school because they know lots of other people want it. But OK. Uh, meanwhile, top trading cycles, although it's recently been used in New Orleans and possibly San Francisco. I'll, we did some, I was not involved. Some other market designers did some work with San Francisco public schools that at the very last minute they backed out of because they were worried that we might use their data to write papers saying, suggesting that their schools were bad. <laughs> they were, I think it was in LA, some, some newspapers, some journalists used the Freedom of Information Act to request a lot of data about how teachers' students were performing. And then were able to run regressions showing that you know, two classrooms right next to each other, one was increasing their students' test scores by a huge fraction, and one was dropping them by two grade levels. And the principals were getting, fielding phone calls. So why is my school in the room on the right, not the room on the left? I don't understand. Or my students, sorry, in the room on the right, uh, not the room on the left. And that happened just as they were about to start launching this, you know, the actual implementation phase of a top trading cycles based design for San Francisco. And San Francisco, as I understand it, sort of called the market designers they were working with and said, so just, sorry, we're just a little curious. Do we understand correctly that in principle, you guys could do this sort of study with the data we've been planning to give you. 
I mean, yeah, in principle, that's probably right. You know, these, these are, you know, we're academics. We're completely honest about this sort of thing. I said, yeah, that's what we thought. Thanks. And then you know, the next day, they decided they were going to take their school choice program entirely internal and not let us see anything. Um, but you know, we, we do know that this is being used in New Orleans, and we think it's being used in San Francisco. Um, we, we don't know. Um, the reason this hasn't, this was originally proposed as one of the repl uh, replacements for the Boston mechanism. As Typhoon tells the story, the reason they didn't use it in Boston was that the Boston people were, were first of all, very excited to use something that looked like the medical match, because everyone knows the medical match works. So they wanted something that looked like something they understood, even if it wasn't necessarily optimal. Uh, and, and incidentally, the reason it wasn't optimal is that the Boston mecha or the, the, the mechanism they now use in Boston, the student optimal stable mechanism, assumes two-sidedness. Where in fact, you know, really it's a one-sided market. And this is like how you trade in a one-sided market. Um, the other thing is they didn't like the idea of students trading. It kind of sounds bad if you're, you know, the, the students who live in good school districts are like trading their schools with other people. Uh, and in a second, we'll see that it actually kind of looks bad in some formal way as well. But okay, so this is the third mechanism under consideration. It's, it's cropped up in different parts of the school choice debate. It hasn't been applied as widely as the others, but it's also very important and I think quite useful. Yeah. Yep. And where is this something? Yep. Yeah, my, my preferences are over the other kids in the school. <laughs> So Stevens just asked a very good question, which is, what happens if you have preferences over other people in the school? Who, you care about your colleagues. This is a very hard problem. Like, in some sense, it's a very, very hard problem. So there is, there's another class of impossibility theorems that say, if there are complementarities in preferences, there generally aren't stable outcomes. Well, complementarities in preferences look like I only want to go to this school if someone else is going too. That's a complementarity. Um, there are other theorems that say in sort of sufficiently large markets, if the complementarities are bounded, so you only care about you know, whether your five best friends go with you and the market gets really big, there shouldn't be problems. But, this is a, but we don't know exactly when those constants become effective. So some computer scientists tried to work it out. The very first large market paper becomes effective at larger than the number of people on the planet. Um, they were able to drop out of you know, a fairly big factor until it too, so it became a more reasonable sounding number, like it's smaller than the number of people in the country. But yeah, we still don't sort of know when exactly, you know, it depends on distributional information. We don't know when exactly these complementarities are okay and like don't pose barriers to design. We actually don't even know whether they pose barriers to design with certainty in the, uh, or with safety, so rather, we don't know whether it's safe to run the medical match with couples. Because couples have complementarities. They usually like living in the same city. <laughs> I'm getting laughs. I have no idea why. Yeah, so couples usually like living in the same city. And that is another one of these complementarities. It's like, you know, I care about my colleagues at the hospital. Or, you know, I care at least about my colleagues in the same city. So I only want a job in Boston if my spouse can also get a job in Boston. Um, we've run the medical match with couples for years. And in fact, we ran it for years successfully without any problem. And only in the past three or four years have people started to formally figure out why this might actually be working. So it turns out that if there's enough heterogeneity in preferences and the market is big, these couple constraints look like they're not a big deal. Um, that said, for sort of caring about the complete composition of students in the school um, at the individual student level, probably very hard. There's a paper by Echenique and Yenmez, uh, Games and Economic Behavior 2007, I think, which shows there's, in fact, an algorithm you can write down that will find all stable matches if they exist when students care about their colleagues at the school. But in general, they, you know, they, they may not exist. So you can run this algorithm for a really long time, and it can spit out no answer. Yeah, uh, is there work that uh, this has to do with types, so to steal Peter's thunder? Uh, suppose that my concern by preferences of the racial composition. So yep. Yeah. There's not able to say the attributes of the then you're in better shape. Uh, I know about the paper that's going to be, so again, we only know things in large markets, but sort of we have things that resemble limit results that progress there. It's sort of say in a sufficiently large finite market, you should get to this continuum economy feature. The answer is yes, you're OK in sufficiently large markets. Um, the paper has not yet been circulated, but I've seen an advanced copy of it. I can't claim to have checked the proofs, but it, 
I think you're okay. Um, but again, this is all extremely recent. So almost all of the work that's been able to push this frontier has been in the last two and a half, three years. Yes? Okay, this is a related question. If you're living in a kind of a racially segregated community or a community where there are a lot of people like you, and then they've got the walkers versus non-walkers as part of the selection process, then it's just perpetuating what's, right? So I mean, so I guess something That's going to be this part. Okay. Yes, you're correct. <laughs> so so finish, finish it, because I want to give you credit for it. No, so. no, 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 I think it's just related to Stephen's point. I mean, I think you could just see how, how you could end up being with types like yourself if you wanted to be. Correct. Um, and in fact, you might not even have a choice. <laughs> so that's going to be the, uh, that, hence the choice, quote unquote. Anything else? Uh, top trading cycles. Can you clarify? Like, yep. uh, this is talking about complementarities. Then it's very complicated when matching is simultaneous. But when we talk about sequential matches, like with the sibling problem, for instance, then it's actually simple. Or am I? Um, because you have complementarities when you have siblings no, as no, well, but right. then you've already like assigned one sibling. So yeah, that's right. So I, significant is that's right. So I just want to push you to be a little bit more careful about what you mean sequential versus simultaneous. So sequential in the sense that you know, if I get a job in Boston, then the next year my spouse is on the job market and I, uh, you know, I try and convince her that she should only apply to jobs in the general greater Boston area. In that sense, you're right. Things are very easy because they're sequential, assuming she can get a job in Boston, which you know, there are plenty of places in Boston that, uh, you know, so that's probably not a huge binding constraint. It may be different if I live in the middle of nowhere in Kansas or something. So in that sense, sequential makes things easier. When, when there's sort of only one agent passes through the mechanism at a time, you don't sort of pass through as groups or pairs or something like that. If you were trying to sort of match both agents at the same time, but do them sequentially in the same mechanism or in the same setting, so some sort of decentralized match where maybe I claim a job, the law market clears before the economics market. So if any of you are, have significant others who are, in the law, who are going to be law professors and going on the market the same year as you, it actually might be you know, more difficult if this were really one centralized market to negotiate jobs at the same time because the law offers are coming in after you filed your applications in economics and you're trying to stall them. Same sort of problem here. You know, the, in, if this were a decentralized mechanism, sequentiality would actually be kind of problematic. But again, you're right. So for, for centralized mechanisms, we just want to sort of clear each agent once. And if we can write down preferences and priorities for those individuals, we're good. OK. So Chicago, I, uh, oh, sorry, I haven't quite gone there yet. So if we implement choice among public schools, we should be able to unlock the value of competition in the educational marketplace. Schools should compete for students. School choice will induce schools to educate, to be responsive, to be efficient, and to innovate. This is one of the other reasons that school choice has been pitched. Does it work? Well, we say that a mechanism respects improvement of school quality. If when students rank the school higher, the school obtains a better set of students. So if you're a school, do you have an incentive to improve yourself? Answer, not too well. In general, With respect to your priority order. So you know, if the priorities are, say, based on test scores, this means if you improve yourself, do you get students with higher scores? That's a lot of the places where they're talking about school competition. That's what they're talking about. So are the better students flowing to the schools that make themselves better, and thus, you know, for the sake of retaining happy teachers and whatever, the schools want to make themselves better off? There is some sort of utility production function assumption outside in the corner there. And that's a little bit more general because in a lot of these settings, the schools don't really have real preferences. It's stuff like walk-in, walk zones, and siblings, but it can mean <coughs> you, you actually fill your roster, and so your school no, doesn't shrink. Yeah, that part I understood the quality thing was worried because I yeah. visualize white academies as uh, throwing their definition of school quality, which I don't think much of. So white academies, I mean, one of the worries, obviously, about the schools is they need to find curricula or uh, norms, et cetera, that can create. No, that's right. So Stephen raises a good point that's sort of outside the scope of what this literature has thought about before. And very generally, I was going to touch on this as an open question that you guys should all be thinking about when we wrap school choice, but I'll do it now. We don't actually have a clue what these school choice mechanisms are doing to outcomes. We have a pretty good sense of what they're doing to like assignment outcomes. We know like how they've changed where the students are going, but we don't have a 
clue whether that makes the students actually, you know, better in the world, whether we're accidentally sorting people into schools in some weird way that's hurting all of them. We don't think so. You know, if you, go, if you think back to this Patak Sonmez, the first example of, you know, leveling the playing field, we tend to believe that these mechanisms are enabling the students who are disadvantaged to go to better schools. But we actually, you know, we don't have an empirical understanding of what's happened. Um, if you're interested in thinking about this, Parag uh, Patak and a lot of his, uh, a lot of his colleagues at MIT have, have built an institution that's basically about trying to collect this data and really understand it. But that's right. So if you think that, you know, if you think that schools might have preferences that are not, societal, not socially optimal, then you might think school competition is bad because they compete to get students, you know, maybe who are all exactly like their teachers or something. And then there's very little aggregate knowledge. There's no diversity or something like that. Yes? Just looking at aggregate data, do you see any differences in terms of like <clears throat> school level outcomes like the around the discontinuity when, let's say, you know, Boston dropped one system, the doctor another system? That's a, because you should be able to, I mean, like, yeah, there, there should be a visible discontinuity of some sort. I have not actually had access to any of this data myself, so I can't speak to it. My understanding from Parag is that the answer is yes. But I've, I've not actually looked at the data myself because the licensing rules, you know, looking at things like preference data is actually very, very, very touchy. And so you need to be closely connected to the system to be able to work with it. And they haven't produced any documents coming out of it yet. So I don't know exactly the state of the, the, state of the work. But my understanding is the answer is yes. So like, it's certainly known that lots of people change their submitted preferences. And in the Chicago case, when they changed midstream, lots of people wrote in with new preferences. So there, at least, we saw people had been strategizing. Uh, I don't actually know what it did to the outcome. I don't know whether anyone has the original data other than Chicago itself. But it should be there. Um, however, you can ask, you know, for a sufficiently large market, so I've got, sorry, so, so to come back really quickly, no stable mechanism respects improvements of school quality, and neither do Boston or top trading cycles. But you can ask, you know, for a sufficiently large market, can they? Well, what's going on? Why don't these mechanisms respect school quality? I'm going to show you this because it's going to come up repeatedly, improvements of school quality. Well, here's what happens. So I have my first choice and my third choice, school Scott. And meanwhile, over here is you know, school Durloff, and it has my second choice. OK. Well, the reason it has my second choice is because he would rather go to school, Dur He'd rather go to school Durloff. Suppose I improve myself. I add you know, a new swimming pool. And my second choice is like, oh, wow, that's so awesome. I totally want to move to school Scott. OK. Well, now he's just freed up a position at school Durloff. And my first choice actually would rather go over here, and he moves. So now by getting my second choice, by improving myself in the eyes of the second choice, I've actually lost my first choice. Does everyone see how that can happen? Yep. Well, so sorry, I've made an assumption that he prefers school Durloff. You know, he's, he, he's afraid of pools, exactly. Oh, no, 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 so, so that assumes there's some change with the pool. Maybe he really wants to study social interactions. But you know, Durloff's already got a bunch of students. And so he's going to come and study market design with me instead. The second I steal one of Durloff's students, he's like, oh, great. I can finally go and study social interactions and moves over there. OK? And so there's this sort of iterating process where by m bringing people to my school, I can free up slots at other schools. And then people might leave me to go to those other schools. This is, this is the problem with. You know, trying to respect improvements of quality with stable matches in small markets. So these, this is right. This is under this is under priority. No, no, legitimate question. So I've just represented this, making it sound like Stephen and I care about who's going to our schools. Um, this is under priority, but almost all of our discussion, we've been talking about priorities. Here, you want to think about schools, students scored by test scores, um, and the schools have some. Maybe they're New York exam schools, where they actually really specifically do care about the test scores. Uh, or maybe they're, you know, they have just some sort of general sense that if they get high scoring students, then they're doing better. So all the schools have the same priority order, which is just driven by test scores. But they get more from the government. Yeah, they might get more from the government. They might just have happier teachers, which means that you know, they have you know, fewer days of substitute teachers coming in. You know, there, there's some external utility production structure that says they want high-scoring students. 
And so, yeah. And I know that uh, the JK athletes in California, they can't um, pay their future based on performance. Correct. That's, like, that's often true. Pay. So I was thinking that they just don't. Oh, but so it's. Even if, you can't, even if you can't pay teachers as a function of student performance or student quality, or, or partially because you can't separate out input from output quality, teachers like having smart students. Right? You know, they, many, many teachers would rather teach at a school where all the students are coming into class every day prepared and ready to learn than coming, you know, coming in once every five days and drugged up. Right? Those are two obviously very extreme points of the spectrum. But OK? Yeah. So um, earlier we mentioned that um, a lot of the impossibility theorem problems reduce as people become more homogenous in their preferences out, either over institutions or over students. Mm -hmm. Now that they've int introduced like the Gale Shapley mechanism over in Bo Boston, yep. uh, and you've got actual data on people's preferences, uh, how uniform are people's preferences looking? So I mean, how how big a problem are the impossibility theorems given people? preferences. So that one also I can't speak to directly because I haven't seen the Boston data. I have seen the Chicago data and there's a lot of heterogeneity. And we'll actually we'll see simulations done based on the Chicago data tomorrow. Yes. So they're like so you have data on before and after and before So no no I only have, I only, I do not have the before Chicago data. Parag might but I'm not sure I'm not certain. I have the after Chicago data which we use for a very specific simulation. OK. So sorry, so approximately respecting improvements. So this, this weird thing, you know, note that what has to happen for this to be an issue is by freeing up a slot at you know, school D, it has to be that some guy from me wants to go over to Stephen's school. right? This is very unlikely to happen if there's a large market with very heterogeneous preferences. It's pretty unlikely that my first choice student actually you know, has as his first choice Stephen's school. It's probably something over here that hasn't been affected at all by this change. And as a result, stable mechanisms do approximately respect improvements of school quality. So in a large enough market, the probability that improving your quality can hurt you is pretty low. Meanwhile, Boston and top trading cycles do not. So what we get here, this is a different reason to favor stable mechanisms over Boston and top trading cycles to some extent which is that they create some incentives for schools to improve themselves. Again, this is sort of a, it's hard to parse how to think about this result because of this large market component. But this is another way we think about things in market design. Sort of like look at the you know, other policy goals. Can we make that a formal criterion and then figure out you know, which ways we can even start to get at it? Sorry? That requires a large number of schools. No, a large number of students relative to the number of schools. Um, and more generally, and this is you know, something you guys can think about again, uh, those of you who play with market design from time to time, which I hope some at least of you will, we don't really understand how these interventions change long-term incentives of the long-term players. Right? Schools are long-term players. They don't leave the market every year, whereas the students sort of only go through the market once. And we, don't, you know, we haven't yet hit a point in the theory where we really understand what's going on, much less have any way to empirically estimate the actual effects. Okay. Last thing about school choice for the day. So uh, school choice advocates, as we said, uh, argue that school choice should somehow oh, in, you know, convince schools to improve themselves. Uh, even more, the school choice advocates seem to suggest, for some strange reason, that school choice programs should actually enable choice of some form. Sound sensible? I'm seeing some nods. Good. OK, so uh, we're at Chicago. I have to mention Milton Friedman. The Friedman Foundation for Educational Choice, well, don't have to mention Milton Friedman, but he's touched pretty much everything in economics. And so as a result, he comes up here as well. Uh, he was one of the earliest advocates of school choice and said, you know, you know the point of school choice, uh, this, is, this is if you go to about school choice on the Friedman Foundation website, they describe it as a common sense idea that gives all parents the power and freedom to choose their child's education. And in fact, the next sentence is while encouraging healthy competition among schools. So they, they even, you know, on, on one line, rank the choice aspect as being more important than the competition aspect. So that, that justifies my even more statement here, right? So a very, very recent paper uh, suggests that some of these school choice mechanisms don't actually allow any choice whatsoever. So this is a, 
Katarina Caslamiglia and uh, Antonio Morales, and I hope I didn't pronounce either of those two names too incorrectly. Um, so they set up a very specific stylized model. So they have, they have a couple of major assumptions. So first, large market. It has to be sort of a, a, a continuum-sized market, but that's, that's not the biting assumption. Neighborhood priority. This is pretty important. So they assume that everyone has a neighborhood school, and the neighborhood schools sort of exactly hold as many students as live in their neighborhood. So there are exactly as many students as schools, and your neighborhood school, you know, you can always go to if nobody else comes to your neighborhood. Okay? And then, this is really important. So there's agreement as to the worst school. So this gets to the question earlier about, you know, what happens if there's a really bad neighborhood? Are people going to be able to get out? Well, it turns out, again, under these assumptions, neither the sta student optimal stable mechanism nor the Boston mechanism allow anybody out of the bad neighborhood. So they all end up with everybody going to their neighborhood school. That's kind of bad, right? So, so no choice in school choice. Uh, top trading cycles, meanwhile, by the way, does let people out. Except what happens is all the kids in the bad neighborhood stay in the bad neighborhood, and the kids in the good neighborhood just trade around. So that doesn't look too good either. Uh, and another natural fix, so a great way to solve this problem. So what's the actual problem? What's going wrong? Well, so this large market assumption encodes a, a full support assumption on test scores. So some kids in the bad neighborhood score OK on tests. Right? They don't all have the lowest scores. Well, now. You know, suppose I have you know, good neighborhood one and good neighborhood two and the bad neighborhood. If I have some students who live in good neighborhood one and I send them to good neighborhood two, then I'd better also be sending some, you know, there's some good neighborhood at least that I'm sending some students from the bad neighborhood two. Because if there's some test score that can get you into good neighborhood two from good neighborhood one, there's got to be at least you know, like one bad student who achieved that score. And everyone agrees the bad neighborhood's the worst, so that bad student would much rather go to good neighborhood too, even if it's sec is second to last choice. Well, OK. But I assume that the neighborhoods were sort of exactly equal to the number of students living in, you know, had capacities equal to the number of students living in the neighborhood. Well, that means there's got to be some student from the good neighborhood going to the bad neighborhood. All right, well, that's really problematic. Uh, the reason for that is that that good neighborhood student could go, has priority his neighborhood school. Right, you can always get into his neighborhood school because they, you have neighborhood priority. Your highest priority is the school that, where you live. And he'd much rather go there than the bad school because everyone just agrees that the bad school is the worst. So it must be that that student, maybe he's from you know, good neighborhood seven up here, doesn't go to the bad neighborhood. He goes back to good neighborhood seven. And the whole thing unravels. And so none of these links could actually be formed. We can't send anyone from good neighborhood one to good neighborhood two because we'd be sending some people from the bad neighborhood there as well. And then to be sending some good kids to the bad neighborhood, a contradiction. Yeah. Um, does this generalize if you have like a continuum of quality of schools or? Yeah, so there, there are a lot of ways in which this result does not generalize. Um, continuum of school quality. You mean like a median, right? Yeah, continue, continuum of school quality, maybe not. It, it depends very heavily on this, this single bad school. Although it could be there are a bunch of really bad schools, and everyone ranks all of those in a big clump at the bottom. Um, I don't know off the top of my head exactly how this would extend if you sort of disaggregated the schools more. Um, but the, the real robustness issue here, I think, is more a mixture of this binary neighborhood priority and you know, the, the way in which this large market assumption is working with the bad neighborhoods. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, the reason this is on the slide, you know, I, I like this result because it shows us that there's something really careful we have to think about here, or something we have to think about really carefully here. Because even if this sort of, the assumptions don't exactly hold, to a first order, we still have this problem that we'd like to move kids out of the bad neighborhoods. But if the good neighborhoods really only want, their kids only really want to trade with each other, it's going to be very hard to use sort of classical market mechanisms to move kids out of the bad neighborhoods. Right? Even if you think about this sort of as like a, you know, a, a Chicago market sorting problem, it has that property. And so this is going to motivate things like um, you know, affirmative action mechanisms. Where do we have this? Sorry. Yeah, so this will motivate things like affirmative action mechanisms, trying to build into these existing school choice systems 
you know, ways of moving people out of the bad neighborhoods. And again, you know, I don't want to take this too seriously as a, as a formal theoretical fact. Like it's not the case that the current system is actually you know, not allowing anybody out of bad neighborhoods. Especially if you think in Boston there's a lot of heterogeneity and people have multidimensional preferences over school quality and transportation time. Especially in New York, the transportation time thing is really big. You know, there is choice going on in school choice in practice. But this no choice fact is a useful intuition about what we have to think about carefully if we're trying to use school choice specifically to reduce inequality in terms of long range outcomes. Yes? Kind of like going to the point that you were making there. Yeah. Um, if there are strong complementarities, it may be that I only want to switch somebody from a good school, but if both of us can coordinate on going to a bad school, our presence then makes the school a better school, right? And For so, sure. Um, um, that could be like another, um, that could be another way to do it. One, one kind of like case in point would be the gentrification that you see happening in a lot of American cities. Yep. But if you have enough kind of like the type of people moving in the city, so that's, that's totally right. Um, although, again, there tends to be a lot of opposition to that from certain groups, like the people who bought the houses in the really good neighborhoods usually don't want to send their kids far away to presently bad schools for the sake of making them better. So I agree with you in principle. Um, and it's certainly something to think about. You know, we, we don't have a good sense of, you know, again, partially because we don't know exactly how much this is affecting long-range aggregate outcomes. and. Partially, I'm sure you guys have heard this week, we don't know exactly how much moving good students to bad schools helps or hurts everybody there. Um, but yeah, it's certainly something to think about. So this, there's a paper on matching with regional caps in Japan where they try and force some of the doctors to go to hospitals in rural areas, which sort of has a little bit of this flavor. Like it's, you know, how do you try and move people? You know, what sort of constraints can you build into a mechanism that will encourage people to go places where they don't really want to go, but where it's really, really high public good value. So I, think, I think the challenge that you see mm -hmm. typically is that, um, I'll use Pennsylvania for example, right? Yep. Like, as the university expands, in a sense, it kind of like creates a very good neighborhood and completely pushes out all of the you know, all yep. poor black folks. Oh, right. So, sorry. So, I should so, so, so in a sense, in a sense like, we can, in a sense, you can use, um, you can use the desire of the university, say for example, to expand to create you know, the right incentives for them to expand while maintaining some semblance of what the, the prior community was. Because the, oftentimes there is some desire to move back to some of these quote right. undesirable areas. It's just that they don't want the existing people to remain there when they move back in. Yeah, that's right. Kevin Murphy gives this example very early in price theory. And who does gentrification hurt the most? Uh, and the argument he usually uh, the argument is the people who lived there before. You know, you force all of them into an even smaller area after gentrifying their neighborhood. Um, certainly right. Uh, and this regional caps type stuff is, has the same flavor, where you're trying to move people around within regions. You know, get some people to the regions that are further away, but not too many. You know, trying to balance all these different sort of quota constraints. Okay. So, we talk. Yeah. I know. Thank you, though. Um, so that's school choice. I was about to say, because we have very little time, we're going to go through these last two applications very quickly. Uh, and luckily, they're more or less planned that way. So cadet branch matching, very quickly. There's this very recent paper that Typhoon Sonmez wrote. And it's based on, you know, it's, sorry, it's a series of two papers, one joint with Tobias uh, Switzer and one that he wrote alone, that f works on this new matching program that the Army has been using to match cadets to their branches of service after they finish ROTC or military academy. Uh, what they did is they introduced a program whereby you could bid additional years of service in exchange for advanced priority at certain branches. Hmm? I'm seeing laughs. Uh, no, not a problem. Uh, it sounds kind of, you know, it sounds kind of funny when describing the abstract, but actually it's a kind of clever market solution, right? So you want to favor the people who want to become career military. Um, the, cur the previous system just, there was a strict order of merit list and you would be matched as a function of your position on this list. And it happened that lots of people who wanted to become career military uh, would end up in branches that would give them no opportunity for advancement and they'd leave in a huff after they finished their term of service. Now they can bid these additional years of service. This is costless for them to pay. Um, and it's only for some of the slots. So it's the bottom 25% of slots at every branch. So if you can get in on merit, you get in. But if you, if you wouldn't get in on merit normally, more or less, you're allowed to pay this additional cost for advanced priority. So it's sort of a, it's a mixed market mechanism. Um, for that reason, 
it's technically fascinating. So this, uh, this system which the military came up with on its own is the, in some sense, the hardest real world application of generalized matching known. We'll talk a very little bit about why that's true tomorrow, but that's completely irrelevant to the present discussion. So instead, we're going to focus on the inequality and diversity issues. The main point of this is to show you that there are things other than school choice where you can take these same ideas. So mostly school choice has been the big application today and it'll be most of the discussion tomorrow. The reason for this is that market designers have worked on it a lot. There's a big literature. We have a lot of understanding about the issues that people are facing in these school choice programs. And we haven't gone out and tried to fix other inequality in many other places. Here, the military was doing that. So uh, only about 16% of the officers were African American or Hispanic. And a lot of the reason for this is that the minorities are not ending up in the combat arms branches. To be promoted, you have to be in combat arms. And now they looked at the preference rankings, and they said, well, what's going on here? Well, 58% of white cadets submitted first choices were in combat arms. Well, only 31% of African American cadets were. That's a huge difference. But now here's a weird fact. They were running a version of deferred acceptance, more or less, except with truncation, serious truncation. So I think there are 16 branches. They only let you list, I think, three of them. And if they, you didn't get the one you listed, they assigned you to whatever they wanted. So that's a huge cost to being unassigned, right? It's not like school choice where you could just go and leave and go to a private school. This is, you're in the military, they can order you around. If you're unassigned, you get to go to the military police. To their credit, they figured out that this was a problem. So they say, on the one hand, this could be explained by minority candidates truly having different preferences. But on the other hand, they might not really prefer these other fields, but rather may reason that they don't have a high enough order of merit score to get into the field they really want. You know, if they think they're not going to get into infantry or artillery or something, they might actually list support, you know, some desk job, simply because they, they know they can get that using the mechanism. So the punchline of this story is a, is a more or less happy one. It turns out that with the correct cadet optimal stable mechanism, you know, with truncation removed, you can actually solve these problems even past the technical complexities. And you can even, you can do a lot more. So Typhoon has this really good paper, I strongly recommend it. Uh, it's on the syllabus about a proposal for further redesign of the ROTC mechanism. Um, and you know, they, they solve a lot of different problems the military had. Another one, you know, one of them being they don't know what the true preferences are, this finding the data. Another one, their proposal will fix, so I have this footnote, you need a, the right priority structure. Currently, the military has affirmative action for students who do badly on tests. I kid you not. So your, your ability to get into different branches coming out of ROTC, there are some slots that are reserved for students who score in the bottom 50% of the students. And you don't get right, and so it turns out to be possible to more or less figure out where you're scoring, you know, how likely you are to be in the bottom 50%. He's got this great screenshot in his slides, which uh, you can find on his website, where there's a Yahoo Answers question. Here are all of my scores. You know, do you know what percentile I'm likely to be in that you know, was removed like the next day or whatever? Um, and so by switching to the sort of the right market mechanism, you can also solve that problem. Because uh, you really don't want people intentionally failing tests so that they get a better shot at being an officer. That just somehow, something about that sounds wrong. Um, but so the punchline here is very good. So a lot of the insights we had before just sort of take into this more technically difficult environment we can use to build a strategy proof, stable, and improvement respecting mechanism. All right, one more example. And the reason we're talking about this one, good, we have exactly the right amount of time too is that I wanted to show you something that's not about matching, right? I'd mentioned there are these two towers of market design. I mostly work in matching. There's also this work in auction theory. Here we're going to talk about eminent domain, which is related to auction theory, I claim. So there are 10 people. They own privately valued homes. I'm going to let you under the veil of ignorance. Uh, these are their values. They're, they're actually 1 through 10, but Mr. 1 is over here, OK? All right, but veil of ignorance back down. You are now the government. You would like to buy the land and build a mall. Maybe you're a private developer. Maybe you're the government working with a private developer. 
Uh, well, what can you do? Well, you only know the distribution of values. So you know that their values are distributed uniformly in this set 1 through 10, and you know, therefore, that the expected value is 55. So how are you going to get all of these homes? Well, first thing you could make take it or leave it offers of 1 through 10. So you just knock on the first door, say, hi, I'll give you 1. Knock on the second door, say, would you like 2? And you make it down the line, well, Mr. 1 over here just got this crazy windfall. You offered him 10 for his home, which is he values at 1. But everyone else slammed the door in your face. The probability of this actually allowing you to aggregate the land is, of course, 10 to the negative 10th. That doesn't sound so good. But now, what if you make take it or leave it offer? So if you give almost all the surplus to the owners, so you offer everybody 8, the probability that none of the values, you, there's no Mr. 9 or 10 in here who have values above 8, is actually still really low. It's like around 10%. And if you have a big community, you're, now you're not building a shopping mall, you're building a highway. It's basically zero. OK, so you can just ask the owners to tell you their values. So what's the problem there? I, you know, knock on your, excuse me, I would like to buy your house. How much do you want exactly? One <laughs> right, one million billion dollars. Right, so you'll, uh, you'll never be able to do it for your 90. They'll eat, try and eat up all the surplus. Uh, and so in practice, what happens is we just take the land. So the government has the power of eminent domain. You can take the land and pay everyone a uh, just compensation value, which the courts have interpreted to mean the minimal possible market value acceptable for the land. That market value is often depressed by the fact that the government is both doing the assessment and paying the compensation. So first thing they'll do is declare the land blighted, all buildings condemned, you know, it, no one's allowed to live there. And they'll say, wow, you know, you're living in a blighted area. That's terrible. But uh, sure isn't worth much to me. Here, have your, uh, you know, $100. Um, and sort of none of these sound like particularly good outcomes. And this eminent domain one in particular is used all the time uh, against people who are not very sophisticated. Right? So you could actually go to court and challenge the assessment, but that's costly and it's hard. Right? So you know, fighting the government, in some sense, the government's own court. But meanwhile, if the government you know, got rid of this eminent domain policy, they'd have holdout. So either they'd have individual holdouts with the self-assessment problem, or they'd have just sort of a completely legitimate holdout. There's some guy with a value too high for the take it or leave it offer. Right? The way you get around self-assessment is you make take it or leave it offers, but with very high probability, there's still someone in the, in the development that has a high value. So, what, uh, so in joint work with Glenn Weil, I've been thinking about how to try and build a system that promotes you know, a fairer version of eminent domain using auction theory. So just very, very quickly, the buyer is going to have a private value for the plot. The sellers have private value for the land. Mechanism as a transaction procedure, the only thing that's interesting about this model is we have shares. We claim that it's easier to measure relative values than absolute values. So the government can go over and look at these farms and say, your farm is twice as big as the other. The aggregate pie, you get 2 thirds. Your neighbor gets 1 third. That's the share. These, um, you know, the closer they are to the true share, so the closer they are to the actual true share of the value, the better the protection of the sellers is going to be. So in fact, if they're perfect, no seller will ever end up giving up his or her land for less than his value. If there's some noise, then you might disenfranchise people a little bit, but not nearly as much as the current system. The, uh, the ideal, you'd like mechanisms that are fully efficient, so you capture all gains from trade. Individually rational, that's again as it was before. No seller wants to walk out. So here, uh, eminent domain is coercive. We can force the sellers to participate. You'd love them to voluntarily enter the mechanism. Uh, we'd also like it to be budget balanced. Unfortunately, as before, there's a major impossibility theorem. So Maleth and Postelway have a great, well, great, very you know, annoying but very good paper uh, that says that these are all in conflict. Actually, they should already sound like they're in conflict from an earlier result of Meyerson and Satterthwaite. So fully efficient sounds bad. So if there's a buyer negotiating with a bunch of sellers, you might pretend that the sellers have somehow pooled their resources and values, and there's a buyer negotiating with a single seller that has a big value. Well, Meyerson and Satterthwaite said you already can't get full efficiency if there's some uncertainty. So full efficiency is going to be stuck. Mayleth and Postelwitz show that if the market grows large, the probability of any trade goes to zero. 
So for any individually rational and self-financing mechanism, there's no trade. So it's sort of like an extreme Myers and Satterthwaite theorem. What Glenn and I show in our concordance paper, and we're not going to have any time to go into what the actual mechanisms are, but uh, I'll very quickly show you what we can achieve, is we can find mechanisms that have dominant strategy truthfulness, so strategy-proof mechanisms, or very close to strategy-proof to trade off for other features. Bilaterally efficient, so as efficient as bilateral trade. So they capture all the efficiency you could get under Myers and Satterthwaite from a bargain between the buyer and a single aggregate seller representing the entire community. Have some partial individual rationality conditions. So the first, and this is the, uh, this is the important one, is what we call approximate individual rationality. You're never forced to sell for more than your, or for less than your share of the, agri, you know, of the offers that would be accepted if you weren't there. So if we imputed a new value of the, of the aggregate plot by removing you and estimating the value of your land from other, buyers, from other sellers' reports, that gives us some new value that doesn't depend on your report. You always get your share of that value. So in particular, if we know the relative shares perfectly, removing you and then re-updating with respect to everybody else's shares spits out exactly your value number as your share. Uh, there's also a collective individual rationality. We never force the community to sell for, its less, than, for less than its aggregate value. And then self-financing. Budget balance is hard. There are impossibility theorems on this as well, but we can at least guarantee that you know, the market maker doesn't have to make any transfers in. The government you know, could, I suppose, pay people for starting an, individual, uh, for starting an eminent domain action, but doesn't have to. And I think selling, a, selling an auction mechanism to the government as here's how you should do eminent domain when they currently have the power to just take things, you want to make it as easy for them to stomach as possible. Yep. Did you say before about where the shares come from? Yes. Good. Um, I was about to uh, correct. That's, that's the last you know, two minutes of this component. So yes. Um, so the shares, we imagine, could come from sort of two different types of location. So one of them is actually you know, the government, to do eminent domain, goes out and does assessments. And if you think their assessments are capturing a lot of information and they're just sort of uniformly depressing all of them, like by declaring the land blighted, that actually doesn't change the relative values. So if you think people can do good property assessments, they're just sort of trying to depress all the values in some nice, you know, in some well-behaved fashion, the relative values are just extractable directly from that. You could also imagine they come from some normative criterion, right? So you could also imagine using a system like this for corporate takeovers. And there the share is actually the share of the company you hold. And we have both a normative reason to like that, you know, both just for the way we define shares, but it also turns out to be good for, you know, from the perspective of corporate governance. And the key is that if you're receiving, so this V minus VI, I really should have written it slightly differently. It should be it should be this. So this is the best estimate of the total of your impression of the value of everything, the whole plot without your information. So everyone else's value minus yours, updated by everyone else's share, or upweighted by everyone else's share. And then you take your share of that. So if you plug in you know, V over the sum for both of these shares, this actually solves back out to be your value. So here we're sort of encouraging some uh, you know, additional parity among the participants by imposing a constraint that says, you know, nobody, nobody's disenfranchised too much. Sort of if all the community agrees that the land is worth in aggregate a large amount more, then the community won't sell unless everyone gets that amount. But someone who's wildly different from everyone else, you know, you, you, know, you like your house and you're not going to sell it. You're, you're um, Jacques and Jacques versus Steenberg. Um, Nobody's taken a law and econ course taught out of Jacques versus Steenberg. OK, ask me afterwards. You're Jacques. You're not going to let anyone cross your land for any reason. Uh, and your neighbors really want to sell their houses because they get five times their values, will allow the government to take your land and compensate you less than your value and pay everyone else a lot more than theirs. OK, so we have a paper where we explain how this works. Not going to go into that too much. But again, you know, happy to talk about it afterwards. And that's pretty much our wrap for the day. Just really quickly, if you'll give me three more minutes, Stephen, I'm going to review the uh, first couple of slides to make sure they actually stick in people's heads. If not, we can pause here. Hmm? What's the payment? <laughs> hmm. 
It's a good question. Yeah, right. So we could actually stand here and negotiate for three minutes instead. That might be a lot of fun. What? I can stay here three more and six minutes of interesting stuff. No, no. You sure you guys don't want to spend the three minutes listening to me and uh, negotiate with Steven? <laughs> All right. So market design. We're using economics and game theory to redesign institutions, different from a lot of economics. Okay? We've seen all of these different ways in which we think about the world. The big one is this engineering thing. You know, there are impossibility results. They're all over mechanism design. That's sort of not good enough if we want to build things in the world. We try and build things. And the things we build are motivated by the criteria that the policymakers have, and also with sort of like you know, grand ideals, like Strategy proofness. We want to create access for people who wouldn't normally have access to the market mechanism, either because they're unsophisticated or, even worse, because there are other sophisticates in the market who are hurting them. Right? In eminent domain, the unsophisticated participants don't have access, but in general, well, sorry, no, 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 even there. So there, it's the, it's the companies, the buyers who are exploiting the unsophisticates. Um, but at least, usually within the communities, they're all equally unsophisticated, so there's not sort of huge amounts of ex post inequality. It's not like one person in the community gets paid $5 million and one person gets paid 20 cents. Um, but there again, you know, we're trying to reduce the coercive exploitative power of the buyers by forcing them to pay something that looks more like the, aggregate, the individual aggregate, and in aggregate community values. And certainly in school choice, we don't want the sophisticated players to be getting all the good schools and leaving the sincere students in the dust. We've seen a little bit about how you might formulate evaluation criteria that are very non-standard. So this criterion, you know, this school competition component, this was very recently noticed. So there was tons of work on school choice. And nobody had quite gone back to that original idea that somehow this was going to make the schools better. And then Fujito and John and Yusuke got together and said, wait a minute, does this actually work? And the first thing he found was an impossibility theorem. In small markets, no. It was kind of eye-opening, right? You know, luckily, they, they were able to refine it and sort of you know, make it into a more compelling result when they talked about the large market case. But when you start off, you're just saying, everyone thought school choice was going to increase school competition. Does it always? No. That's eye-opening, right? You have to think about it really hard to understand you know, why one would even question something like that. And nobody did for a long time. All right. So that's today. We've learned about market design. We've seen school choice. We've skimmed through a couple other examples. Again, I haven't really had time to do them justice, but hopefully I've excited you enough that you'll go and check them out. Tomorrow, very different. We're going to be more formal. We're going to look at mostly current research. So I don't believe there will be a paper. There will certainly be no main paper discussed. I'm not even sure there will be a paper on the slides other than sort of as, you know, oh, here's a really old reference, the first paper written on school choice. There will not be sort of any paper directly connected to the discussion that was written more than three years ago. All right? QED. Thank you.